Hey, Kevin here, Skylabs, bringing you another video. Definitely gonna be a fun one, especially for me. Today, I wanted to talk to you about my top five personal favorite vintage speakers. We've done a video similar to this in the past, and there was a little bit of confusion judging by the comments we got. A lot of people wondered why certain speakers weren't on that list, even though I said this right at the beginning. Hey, Kevin here, Skylabs, bringing you another video. Today we wanted to go over our favorite large size speakers. And by favorite, I mean our fastest selling speakers as a business. And as most reasonable people can probably understand from that clip I just played, that list was the best selling speakers at Skylabs. Those are the most popular speakers. Those are ones that I love getting in the store because they sell fast. However, this is my personal, my personal favorite vintage speakers. This all has the potential to change. I'm just going over what I've heard so far and my favorites of all of them. And one quick thing, I'm gonna go ahead and throw out some ballpark numbers of what I think you would expect to buy these speakers for, but eBay is a really bad source for finding the price point of things in speakers in that they're heavy, they don't get shipped a lot. A lot of them are local sales. And really the price is gonna get kind of determined by what city you live in. The price of these speakers in Podunk, Iowa is gonna be completely different than in New York or LA where you've got 30 times the amount of potential buyers. So just keep that in mind. And my first speakers on this list, and these are not in order, is the ADS L810. And the ADS L810s were introduced in 1975. These are a four ohm, three way, 88 dB efficient acoustic suspension speaker. They are on the large size for a bookshelf. We've got 26 inches by 14 inches by 12 inches and 46 pounds. The original MSRP on these was $650. And today I'd expect you to pay anywhere between 550 to $1,000, depending on the condition. And we've had a lot of comments asking why we don't talk about ADS or bronze speakers. And it really is just because it hasn't come up. And my first introduction to ADS was quite a while ago when we first opened. I had heard of them, I had never heard them. And we had a guy bring in a pair of L810s and also a set of RTR speakers. And at the time, I was really dead set on getting a set of JBL 4311s for myself. So I purchased the RTRs and the L810s and immediately did a little bit of Google searching. And one of the first things that popped up was ADS L810 versus JBL 4311s. And once I started reading those threads and seeing people's comments, it was very apparent that a lot of people preferred the L810s over the 4311s. And after owning both now, I would agree. I really love the entire ADS and bronze speaker line. Every speaker I have heard from them has been absolutely incredible, including the finish and cabinet work. You can definitely tell this was a premium product. The fact that you can pick up a set of L810s for 500 to $1,000 right now is almost criminal. They are definitely an underrated speaker, and I do think they are the best bargain in vintage speakers right now. I think they're almost half the value of what you're gonna pay for a JBL or Eclipse with the same quality. ADS is just not as big of a brand name as those other brands, even though in my opinion, with build quality and sound quality, I think they are absolutely neck and neck. And three or four years ago, somebody brought in almost a brand new pair of Forte 4s, and I was able to get them at a really good price. My thought was, I'm gonna take them home. If I love them, I'm going to keep them. And at the time, my ADS LE10s were in the living room, as you can see in this photo, and I ended up selling the Fortes. Not to beat clips in the ground, but the ADS just sounded better to me. And the Forte is great. Don't get me wrong. That is a great speaker. But the ADS just 
did more for me than the Forte did. I've had a couple different sets of L810s over the years. I had an early version with the cloth grills, and then later I got another version with the metal grills. They both sounded incredible to me. They still do to this day. I'm never going to sell my 810s. I have not heard the 910s. I have not heard the 1230s or the 2030s. Those might become my favorite ADS speaker once I hear those, but as of right now, I have not heard them. And just a general description of how the ADS 810s sound to me. Um, the first word that comes to my mind is balanced in that it's really hard to get everything symmetrical as far as bass, mids, and treble, in my opinion. The treble is super detailed. It's right there. It's not taxing though. It's not shrill. The mid range is everything you want it to be. The bass is great. Um, this is just a really well-balanced speaker where some studio monitor type speakers might sound a little bit on the flat side or boring. The ADS L810s kind of ride right on the line of almost a studio monitor, but still fun to listen to. That's the best way I can describe it. You really kind of got to hear one for yourself in that there's not a lot of speakers out there, in my opinion, that have this level of balance. And then as far as the cabinetry goes and the looks for the ADS speakers, I think they're incredible. As far as I know, I don't think ADS ever put out a speaker that was anything other than real wood veneer. Their finishes always look incredible. I like the looks of the metal grills. This is not a speaker you wanna keep the grills off as the mid-range and the tweeter both use a, it's a real tacky uh, kind of a film on them. And, dust and cat hair and anything just sticks right to it and you can't clean them. So it's a good thing they look good with the grills on because this is not a speaker you wanna have the grills off on. As far as looks go, as far as sound goes, as far as bang for your buck, if you can find them, you wanna grab them. And the next speaker on my list is the Boston Acoustic A400. And the Boston Acoustic A400 came out in 1983. This is an 8-ohm speaker, 88 dB efficient. This is also acoustic suspension, meaning there's no port. These are really large. This is a large speaker. You have to have the right room for it. They are 41 inches tall by 21 inches wide by 8 inches deep, and they weigh 66 pounds a piece. And the original MSRP was 900 for the pair, which was quite expensive in 1983. And today I would imagine if you were to be buying a pair, I think you'd be looking in the $1,000 to $1,500 range, just depending on condition and where you live. Not a cheap speaker, but once again, in comparison to a lot of JBLs and clips, this is definitely what I would consider a bargain. And like the ADS, I really like this entire line of Boston acoustics, everything from the 40s, the 60s, the 100s, the 200s, and the 400s are just the icing on the cake, in my opinion. But that entire line of speakers is really good. And again, very undervalued in a way. A lot of the entry level speakers in this lineup had vinyl wrap on them. So that is the reason why some of them are on the cheaper side, but it's a great way to pick up a really good set of speakers for cheap. They're great speakers. They sell really fast. Even if the customer hasn't heard of Boston Acoustics, which it does happen, a lot of times the A series will outsell a lot of bigger brand names because they're a little bit cheaper. And a lot of times they actually sound just as good, if not better. Once you get up into the A100s, you start getting into that large form with the large front baffle. And that's where the sound kind of changes. And when you get to the A400s, it really jumps up quite a bit. And to me, that large front baffle has a lot to do with why the A400 sounds so good and why it's kind of a unique speaker. It kind of reminds me of these large open baffle speakers that are becoming popular again, especially with the DIYers. That front baffle is almost radiating sound at you. So 
when you're sitting in front of a pair of these, it feels like there's a, a wall of energy coming at you instead of maybe more pinpoint directional sound. Again, they're really fun to listen to because they're not like a lot of other speakers. And the Boston A400 is definitely a well-balanced speaker as well. You'll be really impressed with the amount of bass that comes out of these things being, you know, there's two 6.5 inch or seven inch drivers. Um, they produce a lot of bass. The highs aren't shrill. The mids are great, nice and smooth. The bass is definitely there. This is a really well-balanced speaker. It might not be at the level of the ADS, but the energy you get from that large baffle maybe makes up for a little bit of the balance. And another cool thing to consider if you're looking for a pair of Boston Acoustics A400s, they need to be pushed up against the wall. And so it's not an intrusive speaker. If you've got you know, a medium sized room, maybe you've got some large furniture, this would be a great speaker for you in that it's gonna free up some of that real estate by getting these large panels pretty flat up against the wall. And if you know somebody that's got a pair, definitely go over there and take a listen to them because it's kind of a unique experience in a way. It, it doesn't sound like a traditional bookshelf speaker that's brought out from the walls a couple feet. It's kind of got its own thing. Whether you like it or not, that's up to you. That is the Boston A400. And the next one on my list are these lovely dudes behind me. That is the JBL Jubils or the L65s. And the Jubils were introduced in 1974. They are an 8 ohm speaker, 91 dB efficient. It's a three way ported design. And these are 24 inches by 17 inches by 13 inches deep. The MSRP was $800 when new, which is definitely on the spendy side. And today, these are definitely commanding a good amount of money. Uh, I think you probably expect to pay anywhere between $1,800 to $2,500, maybe even a little bit more, depending on the condition and what's been done to them. So they are definitely holding their value. They're definitely in high demand. I think I could probably sell four or five sets if I could get my hands on them, but um, that's just the way it goes. And again, this is another one of those lines of speakers that everything I've heard come out of the L series or the Century series, um, the mid 70s JBL has been incredible. I've never found a dud in the group and I've had everything from L26s to 36s to 166s to L100s to 4311s. There are more that I haven't heard in that line. I can only imagine that they sound just as good but this is one of those speaker lines that is just iconic and it's definitely holding its value and it's not going anywhere, that's for sure. The Jubal is kind of a controversial speaker. The main one is that the placement of these is kind of odd. That tweeter is aimed at your knee if you're sitting down. And I'm not really a fan of this. A lot of people aren't a fan of this. So I built custom risers for mine just to get them off the ground and get that tweeter ear height. A lot of people think the tweeter and the Jubal, it's a 077 tweeter, is a little bit on the shrill side. And maybe um, I could see why if you were designing the speaker, you might have overemphasized the tweeters and that it's not pointed at your ear. So in this instance, I could see why they wanted the tweeter a little on the hot side. However, if you're like me and you're not scared to play with the treble and mid control pots on your JBLs, then it's not an issue because it's not like these tweeters are gonna tear your head off. I really like this tweeter. I don't mind leaving the treble and the mid range at middle or even attenuating it just a tad if at your height, they do start to be a little bit too much. That's not an issue for me. This is only an issue for the audiophiles out there that are too scared to play with their knobs because it's not perfect. And I'll let you in on a secret. Sometimes I push the loudness control. Yep. Just keep in mind, if you are interested in getting a pair of Jubals, you either might want to leave them on the floor like they were intended 
or you might have to turn the treble down just a tiny bit if you're gonna get a mirror height. But to me, that tweeter, I love that tweeter. A tweeter is usually what sells me on a set of speakers. It's not the bass, because most likely I'm gonna put a subwoofer with it anyway. The mid-range and the tweeter is what's gonna sell it. And I think the detail and the airiness and everything in that tweeter that to me just sounds amazing. And maybe it's because of my age. Maybe it's the fact that everything over 15K is rolled off a little bit, but I don't hear the shrilliness in that tweeter at all. I think it's crystal clear and it is really accurate and it's really precise. This is all personal preference. I think this is an amazing speaker. It's a fun speaker to listen to. There's great bass. The mid-range is awesome. The treble to me is great. It's a great speaker and it's a speaker from the iconic JBL 1970s lineup. I'm sure there are JBL speakers from the 70s that are higher up in the series that are better than the Jubal. This is just where I'm at. I haven't experienced those speakers yet. So for now, the Jubal stay on my list as definitely one of my favorite vintage speakers of all time. And the next speaker on my list is the Dahlquist DQ10s. The Dahlquist DQ10s came out in 1973. They are an eight ohm speaker. It's a five way speaker design. The woofer is an acoustic suspension cabinet while the mids and tweeters are suspended in open air. This is a large speaker. It's 31 inches wide by 30 inches tall and nine inches deep. They weigh 50 pounds a piece and the original MSRP was $800. And if you're looking for a pair of Dahlquist DQ10s today, I'd probably expect to pay anywhere between 700 to 11, maybe $1,200. And the Dahlquist DQ10s are another one of those kind of oddity speakers in that they definitely have a presence in your living room and you either like the look of them or you don't. And it's also no question that Dahlquist definitely borrowed, if not completely stole this design from the quad electrostatic speaker. We have a lot of people actually come in the store, they'll see a set of Dahlquist and they'll say, oh, cool, you've got a set of quads. And um, no, nope, not the case at all. They're just Dahlquist and they look almost identical. And this is one of those speakers that the, the looks are kind of deceiving on this one in that when you do remove uh, the grill cloth, these speakers are ugly. And they look like they were put together by somebody in their, in their shed back in the 70s. It's just one of those ugly duckling speakers that it sounds incredible, but without the grill cloths on, it is ugly. And the first time you see it, you're kind of like, I can't believe that speaker is producing that good of sound, but that is what it is. Um, these speakers sound incredible, especially in large rooms. Because the mid-range and tweeters are suspended, they really kind of disperse that mid and high frequencies more than a traditional enclosed mid-range and tweeter would. And so when you sit in front of them, you really get this large presentation with the music, you know, where you really can't place where it's coming from. Um, if, if you've got a large room and you've got enough power to drive them, uh, Dahlquist DQ10 is definitely a, a speaker you should consider because they are really good at filling large areas with really good sound. It's not a speaker you want in a small room. And in that, I think a pair of DQ10s in a smaller room is kind of a waste And that, you know, it's, it's really gonna congest the speaker. It's gonna make it almost kind of claustrophobic. These need to breathe. They need to be out in the middle of the open. And I think that's just part of the design, but you know, not every speaker is meant to go in every room. That's why it's so important to pick the speaker for your room. And the Dahlquist DQ10 really is a speaker that sells itself. Uh, most people that come in and buy them have never heard of them. But once you sit in front of these and you get an idea of what they're capable of, a lot of times we'll hear this. We'll hear, hey, can you get me the measurements on these speakers? I wanna go home and, and see if they'll fit in my room. And we either get a call, you know, an hour or two later saying, you know, damn it, they don't fit, or I'm golden, I'll take them. And it does come down to that because this has a really large footprint being it's 42 inches wide. 
But once again, this is a really unique speaker and another reason why it's on my list. There's no point in making a list of five speakers that sound really close to each other. In my opinion, every one of these speakers has its own characteristic in one way or another. And the Dahlquist DQ10, that sounds like a Dahlquist DQ10. And I haven't heard a lot of speakers that sound like that. Maybe an ESS would be really similar. I'd really love ESS. They're kind of an honorable mention on this list. I almost put them on this list. But, and the one downside to the Dahlquist DQ10 is that um, if you are going to put them in a large room, you're definitely gonna want a subwoofer. They're just, they're not producing the deepest bass, but um, if you've got a large room, you're wanting a really big sound stage, you'll definitely check out the Dahlquist DQ10s. And the last speaker on the list, maybe the most iconic speaker on the list, we've got the AR3A. I actually found several conflicting dates on the AR3A and when it came out, but I'm gonna go with 1968. I've heard 1967 and 1969, but we'll go with 1968. And these are a four ohm speaker, 88 dB efficient. It's a three way acoustic suspension speaker, of course, because it's AR. And these are 25 inches tall by 14 inches wide by 11 inches deep and 46 pounds. And they sold originally for $250 for a pair. And in today's market, depending on where you are, the state of condition, all that kind of thing, I think you should probably expect to pay anywhere between 800 bucks for a working but really bad condition pair, all the way up to two to 2,500 even for a close to mint condition pair, maybe with the boxes. And like the Boston Acoustics and the JBLs and the ADS, I'm really a big fan of this entire line. Acoustic research in the 60s and 70s was one of the pinnacle brands. They made a lot of really big innovative design choices and they were well regarded as maybe one of the best speaker manufacturers of that era. And the AR3A um, is my favorite. I haven't heard the entire line again, but I've had a lot of 2AXs, a lot of 2As, 4X. I even had a pair of uh, sevens, which I should not have sold those, but somebody got me at the right time and I let them go. And I haven't been able to find another pair since, but I have a pair of three A's and they are just as great as everybody says they are. These are not the most exciting speaker in the world. And if you're used to listening to stuff from JBL and Klipsch and especially Sirwin Vega and some of the more exaggerated speakers, the AR3As, they might seem a little bit on the dull side to you. I mean, these were really praised as kind of a studio monitor and that they're really flat response. They're non-fatiguing. You can listen to a pair of AR3As all day long. They do really good with tubes. They do really good with music that was made in this era. And I think the AR3A is maybe the ultimate ugly duckling speaker of all time. It is one of my favorite things to do including the AR2AX and 4X, is to play some music for a customer that's never heard them before and let them kind of soak in the sound and how good they sound and then remove that grill cloth and let them see how ugly that speaker is behind that grill cloth. A lot of the acoustic research speakers were either stapled or glued down. Those grill cloths were not meant to come off and that's for a reason because once again, you take that grill cloth off and it almost looks like somebody in their tool shed in the mid 60s built these as a kit. Um, but that's the way they came from the factory. They weren't sold thinking the customer was gonna remove the grill cloth back then. I also think Acoustic Research did an amazing job with their advertising during this time. You know, they would go out and take a quartet and they would flank them with a set of AR3As and they would have them perform and see if the audience could tell the difference between the speakers and the quartet playing live music. And they claimed that they couldn't, but this is no different than a Pepsi challenge. This speaker just has so much history in it. Being that it still holds up today with its sound quality is really amazing. You know, are you gonna put these speakers up against a, a, a modern $40,000 set of speakers? No, but for the age of them, 
they will really impress you. There's something special about the acoustic research speakers from this era, especially if you're listening to music from this era, or if you're wanting to get a tube system. It's not that solid state doesn't work well with them. It does. It absolutely does. But for me, I love firing up my Fisher 400, running it into my AR three A's, putting on an old record. There's something about it. It just, everything fits and it just has synergy. And that's the best way I can describe it. You know, the thing with the AR three, a two is they will tell you, this is not a near field listening speaker. When you're up close listening to an AR three, a, it doesn't have the best sound stage. You are meant to sit back from them. And that's when the sound stage kind of opens up and they start to really sound like a live performance. So it's another one of those iconic speakers that if you have the chance to sit in front of a pair, you definitely should is it, it really is a unique sounding speaker. And if anything, it's just the ability to say you've heard a pair of AR three A's and be able to give an opinion on it because, um, I, I don't think there's a lot of speakers out there that sound like AR three A's. And for that, again, that's another reason why they're on this list. Are they better than the JBL Jubils or the Boston A 400s or the Dahlquist DQ 10s? In my opinion, none of those are better than any of them. They are unique in their own different way. That's why I have most of these speakers and that I like rotating my speakers around. I like going from a Fisher 400 with an AR three a to a Sansui AU 20,000 and a pair of JBL Jubils or whatever. The speakers is where I think the majority of the color or the majority of the character of your stereo comes from. So I don't want five sets of speakers that all sound the same. I'd rather have five sets of speakers that are really unique. So when I do rotate them out, I feel like I'm maybe listening to a completely different system and hearing music differently than I did on the last set of speakers. Anyway, that's my list. That's my personal favorite vintage speakers. Once again, this list could change at any moment. I could have another speaker walk in that kicks one of these off. I have not heard every single speaker out there, obviously. By no means am I saying that these are the end all be all speakers of all time. They're just the, the best speakers that I've heard um, in doing this for how long I've done this. And there's a lot of other really good speakers out there. And I definitely want to thank you all for sticking around to the end of another video. Definitely appreciate it. If you're looking for a set of speaker stands for your ADS or your JBLs or your ARs, definitely check out skylabsaudio.com. We have tilt stands that are made here in West Des Moines, Iowa and grab yourself a pair. We've gotten a lot of really good feedback that they're enjoying their stance and that they improve the sound of their speakers by decoupling them from the floor. Also, make sure to leave your top five down on the list. Love reading all those comments. Give us your list of your favorite vintage speakers. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for subscribing. And we'll see you in the next video. Thank you.